All right. Now we are going to go back in the Wayback Machine, back in time, to take a look at what the Trump administration's view was on linking trade policy with environment policy. Um, we've got two members of our newly announced BPC Climate and Trade Advisory Council. Uh, first up, we've got Dennis Shea, who is former deputy USTR and the US ambassador to the WTO. And will be moderated by uh, Dave Banks, who's a fellow at BPC and was former special assistant for international energy and environment at the National Economic and National Security Councils from 2017 to 2018. Uh, so welcome to the stage, Dennis and Dave. Hey, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Thanks for being along and get over, because I'm a slow walker. I'm a southerner. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, Should well, thank you, Dennis. Good place? No, that's good. You know, okay. you're, I like you enough. You don't, ten, ten you don't have to be too far. Like speed dating here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you yeah. for joining. Sure. Really appreciate it. I know the audience is really interested in, in, in your views on and your experience with the Trump administration and how you guys viewed uh, environment and trade. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, the big question out there is, you know, how would a Trump 2.0 potentially view this policy space and, and what sort of work could, could they advance? And so I think with that, we've got less than 10 minutes okay. now. All right. So why don't we just jump in the conversation? Sure. Well, if you want to talk about trade and the environment during the Trump administration, you have to start with the US MCA. Mm -hmm. Uh, U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, which is the revision to the NAFTA agreement. And USMCA has the, the, strong, has the strongest, uh, most comprehensive set of environmental standards of any trade agreement uh, entered into by the United States. Uh, these standards are um, in the core text of the agreement. Uh, they're also enforceable, uh, subject to uh, a dispute resolution. And as a general matter, they require the three parties uh, not to weaken their environmental laws uh, to promote or encourage trade and investment. And there are other elements uh, of the USMCA that relate to air quality and marine life and trafficking in wildlife and uh, illegal fishing. So uh, that is probably the cornerstone of the environmental success that, that USTR achieved. Uh, during the Trump administration. We did other things like, hey, there's an agreement called the U.S.-Peru Trade Promotion Agreement, and there's an exporter uh, in Peru who's illegally harvesting timber and importing it into the United States. So Ambassador Lighthizer, my boss uh, at USTR, uh, blocked that three times, blocked the imports of illegally harvested uh, timber into the United States three times using the authority uh, the enforcement authority granted under the U.S.-Peru Trade Promotion Agreement. Uh, my perch was in Geneva, Switzerland at the World Trade Organization. And uh, one of the things I spent a lot of time on was advancing a, a comprehensive multilateral agreement to curb uh, fishing subsidies. It was part of the U.N. Uh, sustainability goals for the WTO to do this. So we advanced five separate proposals at the uh, WTO. Probably we were part of the ambitious group, along with countries like Australia and New Zealand, uh, to curb uh, illegal, uh, unregulated, and unreported fishing, subsidies for that, uh, to curb subsidies for overfishing and overcapacity, uh, to curb subsidies for distant water fishing. Uh, you see the huge Chinese uh, uh, trawlers out in, <laughs> around the Galapagos, you know, sucking up all the marine life there, uh, to promote notifications of subsidies and to prevent carve-outs, uh, exemptions from the rules for so-called developing countries that were actually very heavily involved in, in fishing. So uh, we, had, we were advancing that in a very comprehensive way, a very ambitious way. The WTO, a couple of years ago, its ministerial um, enacted the low-hanging fruit. You know, they enacted an agreement to prohibit uh, subsidies for IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. But the more ambitious part of the effort has yet to be uh, completed. Uh, at the end of my term, um, 
at, uh, at the WTO, we circulated a, uh, at Ambassador Lighthizer's direction, circulated a uh, general counsel, uh, draft general counsel decision that uh, basically said that any, to clarify the uh, understanding under something called the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, that's a WTO agreement. We circulated a, a document to the general counsel, which is the governing body uh, of the WTO, saying that if a country uh, fails to uh, adopt, maintain, and implement environmental regulations at or above a fundamental threshold of standards, that is potentially an actionable subsidy under the countervailing, uh, under the uh, subsidies, agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. And uh, a, co an, uh, a country, a, a company or hurt by that can actually seek a uh, countervailing duty uh, to offset that. So those are sort of four things, Dave, that stand out to me is, I'm sure there are more, but that those are the four things that came to mind. Well, and let's step back just a little bit too, because uh, you know, for, for folks who aren't that familiar with sort of the trade policy, I mean, one of the, one of the focuses of the Trump administration's trade policy was to hold uh, countries accountable for unfair trade practices. Right. And when we're talking about unfair trade practices, that can include and should include countries that use either uh, lax standards or enforcement and, and compliance, because sometimes they'll have the standards on the books, but they won't enforce, right? Uh, but using, using that record to essentially create a competitive advantage in trade, and right. that's what, and that, so the policies that you guys pursued actually kind of flowed from that principle. That, that, that's actually true. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Bob Lighthizer. I mean, I, he was the most consequential USTR uh, in the nation's history, in my judgment. And um, he basically uh, said, economic security is national security. I come from the Republican perspective, and for a long time, I know you do too, for, I think for a long time, those two things were held separately. Right. You know, national security is, is military, planes, guns, boats, bullets, and economic security is something else. But particularly in the competition today with China, there's just a great awareness now that uh, economic security is national security, and Bob Lighthizer was very instrumental in, in pushing that. And by uh, the way, a visionary, a vi he, he in, in a sense, right? Because, I mean, he's been making these arguments about environment and trade and, and industry subsidies for the pa at least for the past 30 years. Absolutely. Uh, you know, he was a, a lawyer in, in private practice, uh, did a lot of work for the steel industry. Um, but he also, another paradigm shift is that uh, we're not just, that, that Bob kind of pushed very, very aggressively. We're not just consumers in this country. We have to think of ourselves not just as consumers, but also as producers. Okay, a country does not become strong and powerful by buying high definition te televisions and, and just consuming. A country becomes strong and powerful by inventing, by producing, by manufacturing. So that was, I think, a paradigm shift uh, that Bob, Bob uh, helped advance. And he also advanced the point that, you know, our market, we're the largest economy in the world, the largest domestic, largest uh, import market uh, in, in the world. And you know what? We have leverage. We have leverage. Being the largest gives us a lot of leverage. And to your point, uh, Dave, about, um, you know, the, the, we, 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 we have all decided, you know, Cong we're in Congress. Congress decides that we're going to accept some minimum level of health standards. We're going to accept labor standards. We're going to accept environmental standards. These values are more important than pure efficiency. Right. Right? Right. So if we're going to abide by those standards, then those entities who are seeking to import into the U.S. market should also abide by them. And if they're not, then they should be charged, perhaps. Okay, so let's, so the big question that people have, of course, is what, what would a Trump 2.0 possibly do if, if President Trump's reelected? And uh, of course, Mr. Lighthizer, the ambassador, has been on the record supporting a carbon border adjustment mechanism without a domestic price on carbon, of course, I think that's, that's an important nuance there. 
uh, but he certainly he has certainly talked about it, and you brought his book. I brought the book, uh, yeah. And are you getting a dollar per book? No, no, buy? no fee. Okay. I'm not getting okay. any, no okay. cut out of this. Just no want to be transparent, no just in case. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, he, he, he put together, I really recommend this, no, no trade is free. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> he has a, a chapter at the end uh, about uh, the path forward. And that's a very useful chapter to, to understand at least where, where he's coming from. I know you mentioned the carbon border, carbon border adjustment fee, and I'll just read what he writes in here. Many members of Congress would have to take my glasses off to read, I'm getting that old, would like us to have a carbon border adjustment fee put on imports. I agree. If a product is produced in another country by using much more carbon than we would tolerate here, why should that import have a price advantage in our market over a U.S. product that is made producing much less carbon? Such a fee would help clean the global environment and create jobs in America. Now, he's obviously, yes, and he's obviously very close to the campaign, and he's clearly the architect, ar architect of Trump's trade policy today in the campaign. And so the big question that people would like to know, in a Trump 2.0 scenario, do you think there's a possibility that the administration could pursue ideas on how to hold foreign polluters accountable, which could include a tariff or fee on foreign polluters in order to level the playing field for U.S. industry? Well, you know, I'm not, uh, I cannot speak for the campaign, but I... None of us can. <laughs> right. But uh, I, I think that's uh, something that's definitely on the table. I mean, you, you look at the, the platform, the platform talks about reciprocity uh, and tariffs, talks about uh, uh, building up American manufacturing. So... Um, and you know Bob, Bob's point of view is pretty, pretty clear, and he's obviously extremely influential uh, in Trump circles. Thanks, Dennis. Sure. Appreciate it. Thank all y'all.